Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's discussion titled A Divided Union, Structural Challenges to Bipartisanship in American Politics. My name is Brian Fonseca, and I have the honor of serving as the director of the Jack D. Gordon Institute for Public Policy at FIU's Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. Today's program is titled after an exceptional academic textbook edited by former Congressman Patrick Murphy and David Jolly, and of course, FIU professors Dr. Eduardo Gamara and Dario Moreno. The book is really a, a beginning uh, rather than an end. Uh, Patrick and, and David's work uh, in, in sort of as practitioners in this area really uh, gave birth to a, a concept that we wanted to uh, you know, embrace here at the university uh, that was meant to serve as a launching pad for bipartisanship studies, a program that we wanted to codify and institutionalize in the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, the idea I think behind the book was to you know, develop a broader program to scientifically study the issues driving partisanship in America, examine solutions uh, that will help change the trajectory of our politics and promote our findings to constituencies uh, across the country. Uh, the program would support community outreach, publications, uh, and of course, training and education in the era, uh, in the area of bipartisanship. Um, and so again, it, it, the book itself was, was really meant to be a point of departure uh, as opposed to a, a sort of a, a concluding text that, that, that sort of concluded the issues and we walked away from it. So uh, with that in mind, um, it's, a, it's a brilliant uh, uh, work and looking forward to today's discussion. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank uh, Randy Pastana, Anthony Kusich, uh, Patrick Bielova, and, and Patty Sapero for the tremendous work behind the scenes. Uh, and before I turn it over to the moderator, I'd like to make a shameless plug uh, of a new podcast that Dr. Catherine DePaulo Gould and I started recently uh, titled Panthers Talking Politics. Um, the podcast is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, essentially everywhere. And in fact, uh, just to further incentivize you to check it out, uh, the first two episodes, uh, groundbreaking episodes, uh, cover everything from Hispanic politics with uh, Drs. Moreno and, and Gamara. And then, of course, bipartisanship in America with Congressman Jolly and Murphy. So those two, we think, will will make this podcast uh, overwhelmingly successful as we as we kicked it off with with two really good uh, episodes. Uh, it's now my honor to uh, and privilege to introduce my former professor uh, and a true intellectual mentor to many of us, Dr. Dario Moreno. Dr. Moreno is an associate professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations. Of course, before I do that, I wanna give a quick shout out to Books and Books, uh, FIU's Department of Politics and International Relations and the Ruth K. Shepard Broad Distinguished Lecture Series uh, for being an important partner in this, in this effort. And so with that, Dario, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, on the eve of this historic election, uh, we are launching our new book, uh, Divided Union, A Strategic Challenge to Bipartisanship in American Politics. Uh, whatever happens tomorrow, the one thing we're going to be sure of is that the country is going to be uh, divided and split in two after the elections, whatever the returns are. Um, and uh, we're split by competing agendas and competing visions of who we are as a country. Uh, the central question, I believe, of this book, and every author, every editor has their conception is um, is that um, we need to find a way, given this division, to make politics work, to end a lot of the gridlock uh, that keeps the country from being governed and to conduct the people's business. Uh, this book takes a unique uh, approach because it combines both the academic experts and practitioners and not just practitioners in politics like Representative Murphy and Representative Jolly, but journalists, political consultants, attorneys, uh, plus uh, the academic experts. And it's also unique because at the beginning of every chapter, there are the reflections, the musings of Congressman Jolly and Congressman Murphy of sorry, the real life, uh, uh, the real life um, uh, reality of what the academics are talking about. 
Before we begin our conversation, and we're going to begin in a second, I would like to thank two people. First and foremost, the founding dean of the Green School, Dr. John Stack, who I've been arguing with for over 30 years uh, with limited success. Uh, but uh, this would have not been possible without his uh, support and encouragement. And of course, uh, Brian Fonseca, uh, the director of the Gordon Institute, who had the idea of bringing me and Eduardo together with Patrick Murphy and David Jolly. So without any further ado, let me turn it over to uh, Patrick for five to seven minutes, then to Congressman Jolly for five to seven minutes, then to Eduardo, and then to the selected uh, chapters uh, that we will go. So uh, Congressman, uh, and of course, Congressman uh, Murphy represents the 18th district, used to represent the 18th district in Florida, not the one in Pennsylvania. And, um, and uh, the improving the Miami is the uh, smallest big city in the world. One of my neighbors used to coach him in football at, uh, at Trinity Academy. So I'll turn it over to uh, the Congressman. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Dario, so much for, for the great intro. Uh, and I want to thank you and Eduardo, Brian, everyone on the FIU team for all of your help putting this together. And, and of course, all of our, our co-authors uh, who, who really did a lot of the, the heavy lifting and, and research behind a lot of the chapters that hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about today. Uh, just a, a real kind of quick history. Uh, Congressman Jolly and myself, uh, first of all, we're, we're, we're friends when we were elected uh, to Congress pretty quickly because we realized that we agreed on a lot more than we disagreed on. And it became very clear to us in our first couple of years in DC that uh, leadership and a, a lot of the sort of fundamentals around DC were actually incentivizing us not to be friends. Uh, the incentive was actually to, to rip uh, people apart and have them go to their respective corners. And um, when we both uh, lost in, in 2016, our elections uh, started sort of a casual tour around some college campuses and universities talking about what was so broken, right? And we outlined you know, these fundamentals, uh, these foundational problems that we argue, unless we fix the money and politics, the, the, the partisan media and social media, the gerrymandering, the lack of relationships, the earmarks, the lack of regular order, right? All of these different items, unless you fix those fundamental problems, we're never gonna have a true debate on the issues of today, whether that's the debt, whether that's unemployment, healthcare, immigration, climate change, you name it. Because the fact is that the incentive is really about just winning re-election and, and winning the majority uh, in, in whatever chamber you're in. And that's what it's become, you know, that the legislation often starts with a poll to see what is most popular, and then the details kind of get filled in after that. So uh, Congressman Jolly and I wanted to kind of pull back the curtain. So uh, folks that are reading this, and, and especially, and hopefully, uh, future voters and students that are reading this, that are getting a sort of understanding of uh, the way our founders, you know, envisioned our democracy to work, to have this act is kind of a counterbalance to here's what's really happening, right? Here's how all these different things like gerrymandering and money have been bent so out of shape and taken to the max that we have a dysfunctional government that's getting worse and worse and more about pandering to the extreme. So uh, Dave and I were, you know, had an opportunity to work with some, some brilliant folks in this book who have done a tremendous amount of research in these respective areas. Uh, Dave and I gave some commentary to hopefully kind of uh, personalize it, humanize it, uh, put, them in, put it in sort of layman's terms and talk about some of our experiences to really shed light on just how bad it is in DC. And mind you, uh, that was you know four years ago at this point, it's only gotten worse, right? That's the scary part. When Dave and I were there, we thought it can't get worse than this. You know, we're, we're getting ripped apart. It couldn't possibly get worse. Well, guess what? Uh, it has, and Eduardo and, and uh, uh, Dario and I have, have talked about this at length, that what happens, you know, after tomorrow, uh, how bad is it going to be, and, and can we be healed as a nation? It obviously start, starts at the top, but there are some fundamentals that, that need to be fixed. So uh, with that, uh, I will turn it over to the better looking and smarter uh, 
buddy here. Um, my friend, David Jolly, who represented the West Coast of Florida, uh, we had an opportunity to serve together and uh, he's been great to work with on this book. So David, I'll kick it, kick it over to you. Oh, mute, the mute. It's probably good I was on mute. You couldn't hear what I had to say about Patrick. <laughs> but look, uh, Patrick, thank you. Brian, Dario, the whole team at FIU, everyone who collaborated on this book. Um, thank you. And per look, particularly to the research faculty, one of the reasons I'm excited about this is Patrick and I had very similar experiences in Congress. He represented a Democrat or a Republican leaning district as a Democrat. I represented an Obama leaning district as a Republican. And our experiences were very unique, but we came to learn that they were uni unique among a very small group within the Congress. Uh, only about 10%, if that, of congressional seats are actually competitive. And what we started to unpack is how a lot of the structural mechanisms of today's politics incentivize or disincentivize certain political behaviors. And so when people ask, why are we so partisan today? There are broader questions to be had about the body politic, but if we look at how our leaders are elected, the reality is partisanship is incentivized and bipartisanship is disincentivized. So for Patrick and I in public service, that came with certain moral judgments about the need to correct things. But what I really like about collaborating on this book is we have a number of research faculty that have now put the political science and the research into some of these structural challenges to bipartisanship. And what I like is the meeting of, of the political science and the research with the reality of of our political appetite, if you will, in the country, is that it addresses both but abandons neither. And what I mean by that, it's a pure research book. You know, how, how does a, an academic book, how does a system of gerrymandered congressional districts influence political behavior? That's discussed in a very analytical way. What is the impact of closed primaries? What is the impact of big money in politics, of media? All of those dynamics it approaches it in a traditional academic way, but it's occurring at a time when the nation seems to have an appetite for fixing some of these challenges. And that's where it's, a, it's an academic book that fits perfectly within today's politics, and particularly as Patrick mentioned, for perhaps the incoming generation of voters and leaders who we know at a clip of about 40%, are, are suspicious of the two major parties, are expressing a bit more independence, and are geared more towards the reform movements. We are in an era of about the last 10 to 20 years of kind of a rebirth of electoral reform. Now, this is on the, on the political side, if you will, where we're seeing voters mobilized to try to address some of these structural challenges. Uh, in the state of Florida two years ago, we saw voters demand geography as a test for how district lines are drawn. In Arizona, we saw voters demand independent commissions. Go back eight to 10 years, probably, California adopted a top two primary system to try to disrupt their primary system. In Maine, we've seen the advent of ranked choice voting. So this conversation that we are having, but the treatment in the textbook is all occurring at a time when the nation is wrestling with experiments in electoral reform. As you'll see in the book, some of the data is very new, very young. Take California with a top two primary. We can extract certain lessons and data from that, but it's a deep blue state. And so perhaps a top two primary performs in a different way than it might in the state of Florida, where on this election day, uh, voters have and had a choice to decide whether or not to open up the primaries in what is otherwise a purple state. What would the data look like in a purple state on, on primaries, on open primaries? Those are all treated in this, uh, in this textbook. So it's a pleasure to collaborate with such uh, experts in the field of, of research, academic research. And I guess I would conclude with one final uh, touch point on this. And this is about the broader politics, but, but also the treatment in the book. Too often in this conversation around electoral reform, you know, people, people ask, why are, why are politicians behaving in such a partisan way? And then we automatically conflate the solution with expecting more moderate ideologies in our politics. 
And what Patrick and I are very careful to say as we approach this topic is we are not suggesting that anybody change their ideology. In fact, our approach in this book, I think, approaches the, the, the fundamental principle that whatever your ideology is, God bless you. If it's progressive, if it's, if it's conservative, if it's moderate, this is not a book about suggesting that the answers to our, our rigid partisanship lie in a change in people's ideology. Not at all. This is about resetting the platform to reward a political system where all voices are heard, can collaborate, and where there's an incentive. It goes back to the incentive structure, creating an incentive structure for all voices of all ideologies to begin to collaborate, work together, and reach consensus. Because as Patrick said, I think the, the vast majority of politicians have more in agreement than they do in disagreement. We just live in a political system in which those disagreements define our political relationships, define our political identity, and frankly, define the strategy around our politics. Envision a political platform, more competitive seats, legislative seats, a more open primary where, where candidates get rewarded for speaking to a broader audience of ideologies, perhaps more independence. Imagine a world in which we have a different campaign finance system. There are models around the world that provide us different lessons than what the one we have here. Imagine structural reforms to the United States Congress and Senate around cameras in committee rooms or around simply the scheduling of how the session meets. The politics that Patrick and I bring to this are reflected in the academic research that suggests to students, if you want to understand the decision making of today's politicians, it's right here, it's right in front of you. And if you step outside of the classroom and you wanna be an advocate to change it, there are pathways just within reach. So thank you to FIU. Thank you to all the, the faculty that collaborated on this. Thank you to Patrick. Uh, we've kind of been road warriors on this for two or three years now. And this is a long fight, but a worthwhile one. Well, let me introduce our third editor and that is Eduardo Gamara. Eduardo is a common uh, feature on, uh, on TV, uh, commenting on both the politics of the United States and Latino politics in the United States and the politics of Latin America. Uh, me and Eduardo uh, joined FIU one year apart. And, uh, and, our, um, and so uh, it was a pleasure finally collaborating with him on this project. Eduardo, you have the microphone. Thank you, Dario, for, for, uh, for that uh, introduction. And uh, uh, I too want, want to begin by uh, thanking, uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, Brian Fonseca for, uh, uh, for bringing this, this wonderful team together uh, for, uh, in fact, conceptualizing this idea with, with uh, Representative uh, Murphy. And of course, uh, for the opportunity to, to really sit in on, on this, uh, on this uh, wonderful collaboration, kind of being a fly on the wall, uh, watching uh, some of the, uh, the, the discussions, reading the, the, the manuscripts as they came in, uh, and the way in which, um, uh, to a certain extent, um, reflected something that I think uh, both Dario and I for many years had been uh, have been involved in trying to bridge the gap between academia and real life politics. Right? I think this is a, an area where um, I think the congressmen know, of course, that uh, academics, you know, we're, we're known in the, in, the, in the political world as, as eggheads, right? Uh, people that, uh, that think a lot, write a lot of books, but we're kind of detached from the reality of, of everyday political life. Uh, and uh, and so, by the same token, when we talk, you know, amongst academics, um, the common perception is that uh, politicians, of course, are ill-informed, know nothing, uh, you know, theoretical, and know nothing about uh, the science of politics. Uh, and so, this book, really, uh, to me at least, and and I and and I and I know to the rest of my academic colleagues was this opportunity to engage in a, in a discussion and at the same time come up with some suggestions about how to overcome some of the really deep problems that not only affect the United States, but that really are problems of democracy worldwide, right? 
So in many ways, I want to, uh, in my, my brief uh, introduction, really address something that uh, Representative Jolly was just talking about, which has to do, um, and, and also Representative uh, Murphy, right? This, this tension that we have in this country really between the deep-seated structural problems of politics and sort of the contextual issues that, that affect us, especially ele during electoral times. But this tension occurs in a context that frankly is quite problematic. Uh, academics, of course, uh, we always kind of go back to the early notions in the, in the late 50s and early 60s of how the United States was a civic culture, right? Um, a place where American citizens trusted their, um, uh, their institutions above all, right? While they, 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 uh, they had this, uh, this enormous uh, confidence in institutions in comparison to the rest of the world, right? Where, where um, not only, for example, if you look across the border into Mexico, there was this deep trust of the, of the, of the party system and of the executive branch and of legislatures, but, um, but historically, right, the United States had this, this uh, uh, view of itself as having a civic culture where citizens trusted their politicians more than the rest of the world and trusted their institutions. What we're now facing, however, is something really quite interesting. The United States has achieved levels of distrust in institutions that, are, that have even fallen below the levels of distrust in other areas of the world, right? Um, both the congressmen served in Congress at a time when the United States Congress reached only 9% approval. Uh, I've, I've been polling in Latin America for, for, uh, for decades. I have never uh, seen a figure as low for a Latin American legislature. So in other words, the US Congress even has a lower approval. Now I think it hovers around 13 to 15%. What does that distrust mean, especially in the context of the kinds of issues that Representative Murphy just mentioned? The problems with the way in which the media has polarized or polarizes. The rise of social media, particularly after 2007 with the emergence of the iPhone and, 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 and all of these different platforms that we know. With the, with the deepening of gerrymandering um, and with the overwhelming importance of money and politics, of course, right? But today, in some measure, what we have is, is, a, is sort of a, a, a pattern um, and without, without really you know, uh, um, um, denigrating Latin America, right? But we, we've sort of undergone in the United States the Latin Americanization of politics here. And what do I mean by that? Well, as you'll see in, 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 in perceptual studies, at least, there is now a real sense that American politics now has a great dose of corruption, right? That electoral funding, right, uh, um, trends in such ways that it not only, uh, it, you know, deepens polarized, uh, uh, the, the, the polarization in the system, but it in fact incentivizes corruption that we have a, a conflict of interest, right? Between our, that, that our elected leaders suffer from deep conflicts of interest where they can't separate their, fa their family interests from, uh, from their political interests, for example. Things that we have been talking about for a long time in Latin America. And in fact, and here's the, the issue, I guess, that, uh, uh, that really struck my, my, uh, me when, uh, reading the chapters and looking at some of the discussions that we had and, and listening now to my colleagues, that in a sense, much of the world has moved to address some of the problems that I just mentioned. For example, some of the rules about electoral funding are much stricter in Latin America in the vast majority of Latin American countries than they are in the United States. Some of the rules of conflict of interest are extraordinarily difficult to overcome. Uh, it would be impossible to think, for example, of a Latin American president naming his daughter or his son-in-law to a prominent position in either foreign policy making or domestic policy making. Uh, 
But the one thing that links us all, and, and this is really where, where the big issue is, I think is that um, the United States is deeply, deeply polarized, but so too is the rest of the world. And that polarization uh, essentially means the emptying out of the middle, right? And, and so the thrust of the book, the thrust of the discussions that we had was how to essentially fill the middle. And what Dario and I found uh, in, our, in our conversations was that uh, um, while there's a lot of, you know, nostalgia about bipartisanship, right? And, and about uh, how there was a moment in which both parties kind of came together and and co-governed or, or built consensus and compromise. What we found is in fact that uh, they are very few and very precious moments. And they, they were moments in which, you know, uh, uh, were very carefully constructed, right? And, uh, and those can be detailed. And, and uh, uh, what we find ourselves in today is in such a pattern of polarization, however, that even the possibility of achieving that kind of rebuilding that center, bridging, bridging the, the gap between one side and the other appears to be a very remote possibility. And so I think it's for that reason that this book uh, and uh, what Representative Murphy and Representative Jolly bring to us today is important. It's the possibility of Republicans talking to Democrats. It's the possibility of offering solutions that will allow us to bridge that gap. Uh, because I think, you know, in, in just looking at some of the chat uh, uh, comments here, if we don't do that, then the pattern going forward uh, is likely to be worse, no matter who wins the elections tomorrow. tomorrow. Uh, we may each have our little, you know, our hearts in, in a, with a particular candidate. But the reality is, given the structural reality that we face in this country, that no matter who wins, the divide is going to deepen unless we can find some uh, ways to overcome this. Thank, Thank you. you, Eduardo. Uh, now from uh, one of the longest serving members of the political science department to one of our newest members, uh, though very accomplished, uh, Dr. Todd Maskey. And Todd actually offers us in his chapter kind of a unique perspective in looking at uh, bi bipartisanship at the state level. And, uh, and he will share some interesting findings with us. And, um, and I've always appreciate uh, Todd's scholarship because he really does think outside the box of sort of tr uh, traditional uh, political science. Dr. Maskey. Thank you, Dario, um, and thank you for the opportunity to contribute to this book. Um, the argument I'm going to make today is that there are benefits um, when a citizen has representation from each party, what I call bipartisan representation. Um, so you, the citizen, have one Democrat representing you at, in some office, say the United States House, and maybe you have another representative from the other party representing you in say the United States Senate. Um, let me be clear, what I'm talking about is not split ticket voting. So two decades ago, split ticket voting was a big topic in political science. You know, this idea was, are people trying to produce divided government? Are people looking at their ballot and saying, I'm gonna select one Republican and one Democrat deliberately um, that has kind of gone away. Um, there are not as many split ticket voters anymore. And that's obviously one of the consequences of polarization. And so we're talking about that a lot less. Um, what I'm talking about is not happens, it is not deliberate behavior on the part of voters, but happenstance outcomes um, from the way that districts are structured and the way that election outcomes occur. So my goal here is not necessarily to explain why this happens, although you know certainly we could uh, come to some conclusions about that. Um, but I'm going to make an argument for why looking at this is important. Um, so first of all, from the voters' perspective, 
Um, if you are a voter and you have one Democrat who represents you in Congress and one Republican who represents you in Congress, um, there's the nice thing about not always being on the losing side in an election. Um, by the way, you know, thinking about South Florida, almost everybody in Miami-Dade County and Broward County has this uh, bipartisan representation that I'm talking about. Basically, anyone who's not in District 25 has a Democrat in the House right, right now and a Republican in the Senate. Um, and roughly 40% of Americans have this um, in 2020. Uh, but that number is actually down quite a bit. Um, it was well over 50% 20 years ago, and it's declined by over 10% since then. And what my chapter is really about is looking at this at the state legislative level. And the, there, the numbers are even lower. Um, so like I said, the benefit of not always being on the losing side, um, another benefit is that you have voice in the institutions. And the more that we get to this idea that party is an identity, which is you know, a very big theme in political science literature nowadays, the more important it is that an individual has or feels like they have a voice. It also means that you get to hear competing perspectives from those who are governing, right? So when we have an election, you hear from the Democrat, you hear from the Republican in a campaign context. But I think there's also something valuable about hearing from both parties in the governing context, um, what we sometimes call in the political science literature credit claiming when members of Congress or state legislators are saying, this is what I've accomplished, this is what I've done for the district. Um, and so those are all kind of ideas from the voter side. I also argue in this chapter that bipartisan representation is a good thing from the legislative side. And what I mostly focus on in my analysis is how legislators collaborate and specifically how they collaborate across chambers in the state legislatures. Um, so as I mentioned a little while ago, uh, only about 20% of Americans have this bipartisan representation in their legislature. Most Americans have, if they have a Republican in the lower chamber of their legislature, also have a Republican in the upper chamber and same thing with Democrats. Um, so compare that to the 40 or 50% that I mentioned regarding Congress. And what I show in these analyses is that these, what we call dyads, you know, pairs of members of a legislature, one in the lower chamber, one in the upper chamber, that the dyads of people who represent the same constituents but represent different parties are a really crucial um, cog in the, in the legislative process, if you will. Um, that when two people share constituents, even if they don't share a party, they have a reason to collaborate because they have the same constituents, those constituents have the same priorities, the same problems. And so what I show is that these pairs of legislators are both more likely to collaborate with one another. And by collaborating here, I mean co-sponsoring each other's legislation, because when we talk about collaboration in legislatures, that's, that's typically the, the measure that we look at in the absence of say, you know, complete information about who talks to one another. And what I show is that these dyads, these pairs of individuals who collaborate um, really play a key role because they collaborate more often with one another and the collaboration patterns are more stable from one year to the next. Um, and so if Congressman Jolly and Congressman Murphy had continued to serve in Congress and were still there today, I suspect that um, they would be collaborating, um, you know, just as often and continue to collaborate. Um, and what I'm looking at is this collaboration, not only across party lines, but also across uh, chamber lines. So when members of the upper chamber are collaborating with members of the lower chamber, that's often what it really takes to get things done. Because if you pass legislation through only one chamber, um, that's, that's not gonna do the trick. Um, so basically, um, the argument I'm making in this chapter is that this is a concept worth looking at. Understanding the causes of bipartisan representation, understanding the implications of bipartisan representation, and when we see that it's declining over time, um, in part this is 
caused by polarization. But I would argue that bipartisan representation is also in some ways a tonic for polarization. And so I think we as political scientists uh, could benefit from giving this, this concept more attention. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Todd, excellent. Um, I, I'd like to introduce Sean Foreman, who is the chairman of the History and Political Science uh, Department at Barry. Uh, I have known uh, Sean in many roles as a student, as my TA, as my roommate, and on his PhD committee. Uh, Tom, uh, Sean is a local fixture on Miami media, commenting on local politics. And he also has the distinction of uh, being the only member of the panel who was a D1 wrestler at Claren University. So he can drop you on his head if you don't agree with him. So without uh, further ado, let me turn it over to my good friend, Sean Foreman. Thank you very much, Dario. Thank you everyone for having this panel. Uh, this is really great for me because as was just mentioned, I was a graduate student at FIU uh, in fact, I was a graduate assistant for both Eduardo Gamara and Dario Moreno. And so this is full circle to be able to collaborate with them professionally on this project and others. Uh, thanks, Brian, for leading this off. And actually, Catherine and I were graduate students together at FIU. Um, and uh, while I don't think I've met uh, Representatives Murphy or Jolly in person before, I see Jolly on TV. Um, but Murphy, uh, you don't know this, I don't think, but I know the person who used to drive you to uh, middle school every day. Good friend of mine. In fact, my brother-in-law, I believe, was your senior high school uh, civics teacher, Matthew Nichols, as well. So uh, small world, <laughs> as far as that goes. So all right, there are many, many good questions in the chat. So we want to get to that. Um, I got to talk about, write about money and politics and um, became more discouraged after writing the chapter that uh, we really don't have a good way out because of the structural challenges that are mentioned. And uh, really I point to, we've always known that money is the lifeblood of politics. It's just gotten uh, more important and more saturated over the past decade. Two events I would point to, one is the Supreme Court decision in the case of Citizens United versus FEC 2010. Uh, we're all aware of that decision, which essentially treats corporations as individuals that can spend uh, unlimited amounts of money, and in fact, can even uh, spend undisclosed money on campaigns. And, uh, you know, for a while after that, there was talk of, um, you know, we need to overturn the Citizens United decision or possibly have a constitutional amendment go around it. Um, that talk has sort of uh, dropped off over the past couple of years because both sides benefit from that unlimited money. The second event is when uh, Representative Jolly in 2014 with others blew the whistle on the system on the 60 Minutes interview in which they uh, outed the sweatshop in which they were being forced into the dark room to make dialing for dollars uh, one of the biggest usages of their time. And we sort of knew this was going on, but not to the extent, political scientists, journalists, politicians knew it, but not to the extent that we found out and now the whole public knows, right? So the amount of time that's put into raising money, um, you know, again, uh, Representative Jolly talking about how the house schedule was actually arranged around fundraising, no committees meetings during lunchtime, you see people walking down the street to go to their call-in center. So I point to those, those two things, uh, the Supreme Court, a uh, Citizens United decision, and sort of the open secret that fundraising is so important to keeping your job um, that we're in a wash in money. So each cycle we break the record with more and more spending. Uh, they say there was about 6 billion spent in 2012, 6.5 billion in 2016. And we're probably looking at about 8 billion this year, probably about uh, you know, four or so on the presidential and other 
three or four uh, overall. So we're awash in money. What are we going to do to fix it? Let me spend a couple of minutes on potential reforms. Uh, one would be to overturn the Citizens United decision in the Supreme Court. Wasn't likely before, probably less likely now that we have a six to three uh, Supreme Court with six conservatives that would most likely vote to reinforce that decision. You could pass legislation, bipartisan legislation to fix the system. In fact, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002, the BCRA, also known as the McCain-Feingold Act, is the last significant piece of campaign finance reform that we've had in this country. There was a big effort around getting the moderates together to get that passed, but it has subsequently been relatively gutted by several Supreme Court decisions and there, there's not much appetite for new law. So we could try to pass a new law or pass an amendment to get around Citizens United, but those don't seem possible at all. So we have to work within the system. We can try to promote more public financing. Public financing is probably not going to work because that's gonna limit how much money candidates can have in their campaign overall. In fact, most candidates um, pass on public money so that they can go ahead and, and continue to raise unlimited amounts of private money. Uh, so public finance is probably not gonna happen in the United States, especially because our campaigns are so long, so expensive, so many of them. Maybe some innovative ideas. At the local level, they've tried something called democracy dollars in city of Seattle election. Not sure that this is gonna work on a large scale, but maybe in a city, uh, democracy vouchers. So what they did was give every eligible voter a voucher for $25. And then you can donate to the local candidates with that money, which is paid for out of the city coffers. It's a public financing program. It gets buy-in from the individual citizens. It's sort of contained within that race. Uh, those people get those dollars, can spend them. Again, it's a neat idea for a local level, but you'd really need to get buy-in by everybody within that jurisdiction. Not likely to work nationwide, um, but it's an example. Another example, mutual disarmament agreements, something called the People's Pledge. In the year 2012, Elizabeth Warren versus Scott Brown, they took this pledge where they pledged not to accept outside money. Or if there are people trying to run campaign ads on the outside on the behalf, they would renounce them. Um, long story short on that, it was an expensive campaign, but it was probably not nearly as, as negative as some of the other campaigns that year. But when Warren ran for re-election, uh, her opponent asked her if she would do this people's pledge and she said no because she already had a big bankroll in her account from the previous race. So it didn't really make sense for her. Some others have tried this on an individual level, but again, you have to get rid of all the other noise if you're gonna have this uh, mutual agreement work. So we're only seeing them on little uh, basis. Last couple, legislative recusal rules. If you accepted money from a particular company or donor, that has an issue before the legislature, you must recuse and not vote on that issue. Imagine that. Um, so as you can see, a lot of these things are gonna take, uh, you know, uh, the individual politicians and parties agreeing to put regulations on themselves. Uh, mutual arms race reduction. But short of having laws forcing that, that's not likely going to happen because the money is important and necessary, the stakes are so high. So again, I'm a little bit discouraged after doing this chapter. I don't really find a quick or easy solution for us. We're probably gonna have even more money from even more sources in the upcoming elections. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Foreman. And now uh, we're gonna move on to someone with practical experience and often in politics there's the great refrain of blaming the, the messenger which is the media so we have with us today uh, thomas langhorn 
who did this chapter on uh, relationships in Washington. And uh, I'll turn it over to him. Thomas, are you there? Oh, we lost Thomas. Uh, um, let me then go over to uh, Catherine DePaulo, uh, who Sean Foreman uh, uh, correctly said is a graduate of the FIU Green School and the Political Science Department. I also served on Catherine's committee. Uh, you know, uh, oh Thomas, you're 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 I'm there. Here. All right, uh, you're ready. You're on. All right. Well, um, I am a reporter at the Evansville Courier and Press in Indiana, and I went to Washington um, to write a series of stories about how Congress works that would uh, tell our readers, you know, something beyond what the congressman tells them and show them what he does in Washington. And from that, uh, other ideas grew, and I wrote, I think, about a half dozen stories. And Anyway, I was writing a profile of our member of Congress, Larry Bouchon, and uh, I met Congressman Emanuel Cleaver uh, outside the Capitol. I started to ask him about Larry, you know, how, how does he do? What, what does he do? What's he like? And, you know, what kind of weight does he pull? And uh, that's what I was there to talk to him about. And to my surprise, he said, he said, who? And I said, Larry Bouchon, member from Indiana. And you know, he thought and thought and just didn't know who he was. And Larry had been in Congress for eight years at that point with Cleaver, and he had no idea who the guy was. And I, my, I thought, well, how can that be? And uh, so I, I chased that rabbit hole and I find out all about how members of Congress <clears throat> don't really know each other, especially, you know, on the other side of the aisle. Um, I think Cleaver told me the only time he ever sees the Republicans is when the committees vote. And uh, so, you know, I, I found out all about how in the old days they used to hang out together after hours and um, do things together. And because of that sort of bipartisan harmony, they their kids would play games together and, you know, they knew each other and everybody lived in Washington and they, they weren't too harsh with each other on a personal level. And then the 90s came and it became a political liability to live there. And um, now you have the flyaway Congress where they, they move around on the Hill in almost a frenzy, you know, four days a week and they stop, they never stop anywhere for more than about 30 minutes at a time, I'm told. And um, then they fly away. And they go home and they spend the time that they used to spend uh, socializing together, raising money or campaigning or, you know, doing something at home. And they just don't know each other anymore, R&D. And um, so, you know, that's what my story was about. It all began with the idea that two members of Congress had been together almost a decade, didn't know each other at all. And one of them hadn't heard of the other. So... Um, don't know what I can, I mean, I could, you know, handle a question, but, um, that, that's what I have, um, Thank I, I expanded Thank the book and, and I expanded the, uh, story, uh, with more reporting. And I, I, um, I actually got to communicate with Newt Gingrich, who Democrats explained to me was the, the whole from their point of view is what he did when he became speaker that poisoned everything. And, you know, he said, I hadn't been doing anything that they hadn't been doing for decades. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Patrick. We'll get to the questions in a couple of, uh, Thomas, we'll get to the questions in a couple of minutes. Uh, let me end with our last, uh, interjection from Catherine DePaulo, who, uh, as I was saying, is a graduate of the Green School. And uh, Catherine has worked on a, on a lot of subjects dealing with local governments and state governments and, uh, and the role of, uh, of women in politics. 
um, and her uh, contribution centers on uh, sort of the sons of C-SPAN, right? The, the, the first generation when we put cameras in the chambers. So uh, you have the microphone. Well, thank you so much, Dario um, and, and Congressman Murphy and Jolly and everyone who has worked on this project. I was really honored to, to be a part of it. And I really enjoyed doing my chapter on grandstanding um, in legislative committees and more um, and what has sort of become the C-SPAN version, right, of, of grandstanding and committees and the chambers and how that has contributed to how 24-hour cable news covers policy making, um, which has really become um, sort of out in the open on camera versus behind uh, in, in back rooms for, for good or, or, or evil. Um, and also, of course, on social media. Um, you know, hyper-partisanship, this sort of idea that you know, I identify with this party and this party is my team and we are out to defeat and destroy the other side has really become a staple, I think, of legislative policymaking in Congress, but also what Todd pointed out is increasingly at the state level and in state legislatures. So I think at least for the short term, um, may, compromising to come up with policy um, is, is sort of gone by the wayside. And, and I was really excited to do this deep dive into the history of C-SPAN. Um, I'm, I'm sort of one of those avid C-SPAN watchers, I will admit. Um, mostly the stuff they do on their book talks and, and that sort of thing, not necessarily uh, everything else, but I always seem to have it on in the background and over the years seeing you know, how politicians, grandstanding is nothing new, right, to politicians, um, but the advent of, of cameras and having clips go out onto the local and the national news, and now certainly out through, through social, social media has been somewhat different. Uh, in 1979, when C-SPAN was created and cameras were put into the House of Representatives, um, it really was to bring more transparency to the process. And it did some of that, right? Um, there's still a lot of things that sort of are used to happen anyway, over a beer, over lunch, uh, across the aisle that we don't see as much anymore. But there is that incentive to grandstand. And I think as we talk about incentives to, um, for a lack of bipartisanship, that certainly is one of them. This idea of going public, we really looked at as political scientists back in the Reagan era and presidents certainly who can, who went over the heads of members of Congress and straight to the American people to try to influence public opinion and influence policymaking results. This has really, I think, gone down to the, the, the individual level in terms of members of Congress who use their time in legislative committees. We certainly see this uh, in terms of Supreme Court confirmations. Um, we saw it certainly with Brett Kavanaugh and Senator Cory Booker who had a Spartacus moment and, um, and, and, and to a certain extent with Amy Coney Barrett, but also in other committees, uh, whether they be committees in terms of oversight of some of these executive departments and what is happening or in terms of, of looking at potential legislation, but also on the floor of the house. And, and to follow up with Newt Gingrich, you know, he was really the architect, this um, minority Republican leader who was able to use C-SPAN to great effect and to get that time on the floor of the House for these members who didn't have much power at all. You don't have power in the minority really at all in the House um, and be able to get out the Republican message and speak to the voters. And that really led to um, the 1994 elections in which Republicans took over the majority in the House that they hadn't had for 40 years. And we could certainly debate whether this was a positive or negative thing, but over the last 25 years, we've seen um, every party, members of Congress, use their time <clears throat> not so much to figure out what's going to be good policy, and we could debate what that is another time, but to use it to really speak to not only their constituents, but to a broader audience because these clips that'll be picked up on C-SPAN in committees on the floor of the House and of course the floor of the Senate, uh, which was 1986 when those cameras were, were brought into the Senate. Uh, they, they felt by the way in the Senate that they were losing that public relations battle to the House, um, which had that 
uh, had C-SPAN in there. Whether you're talking about um, the House or the Senate, committees, the floor, they are using that particular time to, to talk to somebody else. And that somebody else really is the 24-hour cable news and what they could throw out there on Twitter in particular. And I think the ability to negotiate behind the scenes, right, uh, which some may see, say is seemly and non-transparent, has produced some positive results, including when Senator Patty Murray and um, House Leader Paul Ryan were able to come up with a budget in 2013, it doesn't really even seem possible today um, because you are now position taking over the airwaves, if you will. And this really has become a zero sum game. Um, this idea of grandstanding really ties into a lot of what the other chapters are speaking about, which is you can no longer disagree without destroying. And, and I think that's really where we're at in American politics. You know, we have this election tomorrow. One side is gonna be deeply unhappy. And I think unhappy is not strong enough a word. And how we're able to come together and compromise sort of that dirty C word um, in DC and in other places now um, is, is just not something I saw 25 years ago when I got involved in politics. And I think that's something we need to come back together. And instead of talking about all of our differences, talking about what can bring us together. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. And for those of you who think that change cannot happen, we had two congressmen, three academics, one newspaper man, and a Cuban moderator, and we got through in less than an hour. So miracles do happen. And, uh, I'll, and let's get into the questions and answer because we, we've uh, got in a pretty good uh, debate. And, um, and let me ask this to um, everyone and, and you chime in as you feel like it. Um, there's a lot of kill the messenger, uh, blaming the 24 hour news cycle uh, um, for uh, uh, a lot of the ills that affect American politics. Uh, and also now, you know, we have Fox News, which represents uh, one perspective, C uh, MSNBC, uh, very proudly another, and CNN, uh, you know, trying to figure out how to get its ratings up. Um, so what do, what's the role, how can the 24 hours news cycle is here to stay, the internet is here to stay, um, how do we deal with this, with these uh, new technologies that are causing so much uh, disruption in, these, in the political system? Uh, I'll begin with uh, Representative Jolly, and then we'll go to Murphy, and then the rest of you. Sure. Look, thank you for that question. And I think, you know, Patrick often says that media is the hardest one of these to to kind of crack the nut because of our constitutional protections around a free media. And I'm somebody that embraces an unfettered free media, even in the world of social media. I think personally, I'm glad they're not regulated as utilities. I think it's, it's one of the purest platforms for expression, uh, provided that there are certain curtails around uh, inciting violence and other, other speech that would otherwise be subject to regulation. Um, I do think, though, we can look to those same markets that have created, call it partisan or ideological media platforms. I think we can look at towards those same markets to create a product that caters to what really is um, a strong part of the country, if not a majority. And I, I'll give you a statistic that, that surprised me when I came across it. You know, if you take the three major cable networks, Fox, MSNBC, and CNN, on any given night, even during this, the past four years where we have seen increased viewership, you have roughly 13 to 14 million people watching those three networks combined. Well, in the, in the Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump race, I think you had about 130 million people nationwide who actually voted. So if you consider the viewership of those platforms versus the total number of voters, I think what we are experiencing, and, and this really is a research science question that I'm sure has touched on as well in some of our conversations, you're seeing the outsized influence of the high intensity voters conversation 
but it is not reflected always in in the broader body politic. Look, at the end of the day, regulating media is going to be a very tough thing to do. When we talk about unrigging some of these other issues, creating more competitive elections, you know, the, the big three, we talk about gerrymandering, primaries, money, so forth. Part of what we hope is that if we create a an infrastructure to our politics that elevates cross-partisan voices, that those who who perhaps speak with a different message now begin to win races because they can actually fairly compete with a diverse constituency, I think media will flock to the winners, right? So you know, Patrick often says, if we can unrig one of these, the others start to fall. I think media is a perfect example. If we can create a, an electoral system in the United States that elevates voices that speak to all of us and speak to the better angels, speak to cross-partisanship, media will flock to those because that's where the winners are. Today, we have a system, a political system that rewards the fight instead of rewarding the solution. And the media follows along with that narrative. I'll just add uh, to that, which I agree with everything David said, um, the piece about facts, right? We, we are operating from two or three or <laughs> multiple different sets of, of quote unquote facts. Uh, that's a real problem. Uh, not only do we have different facts, uh, but certain news stations uh, and social media in particular are only giving you one story and completely forgetting about another story. For example, you don't hear anything about, say, Hunter Biden on MSNBC. You go to Fox, that's all you hear. So certain stories are just like forgotten about and, and have, you know, both sides are plenty guilty of this. Um, it, it's so bad with social media. And this was one of the questions in the Q&A that I was typing to somebody about. Uh, was foreign adversaries have figured this out. It's actually a lot easier to defeat the United States of America from within instead of trying to defeat us you know, externally, come from within and weaken our democracy and so doubt uh, in the electoral process and the two parties uh, and, and, and everything that we have fought so hard for in our country. And we have seen plenty of evidence of Iran, China, Russia, et cetera, uh, actually sowing more and more hatred and, and pushing out ads uh, to select groups of people. So uh, the social media component of this is, is very scary. I think we all have a family member or two um, uh, who, who listens to Facebook maybe a little too much. Um, you know, my, my birth mom called me not too long ago and said she's never going to take a vaccine. She's scared about it. There's a chip in it and, you know, we're tracking her. I'm like, mom, what are you talking about? You know, like the US government, we can't even figure out, like, you know, basic 101 type things, much less putting chips in vaccines, you know, um, but I'm sure we all have somebody like this um, that's reading a lot of Facebook and I'm not trying to, you know, discredit all conspiracy theories on the web, but, you know, there's some scary ones out there and they're getting more and more credence like right now. So uh, I would hope there's a way eventually that we can come up uh, with a sort of a, a truth basis where there is an independent panel that is really uh, helping people that don't follow this like people on this, you know, Zoom call today do. Uh, that really they want to get quick set of facts that they can go to a reliable source to get that information. Uh, we're all become so biased in the media we go to. Uh, it, it's becoming harder and harder to convince the other side that our media is in fact truthful. So uh, this is no doubt the toughest one, but uh, as David said, if we can fix the money or the gerrymandering or lack of relationships, all of these things together will start to fix uh, this problem of partisanship in our country. If, if I could just add one one piece of context, because I do think it's important for, for people who are viewers. There's always a challenge within media, how to determine both newsworthiness and then how to present a story. And the example I give is if a candidate runs on a platform and says, I'm going to increase education spending by $10, and then they only increase it by five, is the story that that politician cut education spending by five and broke their promise? Or is the story that they increased it by $5? That there's no good answer to that. And in, in newsrooms for 100 years, they've wrestled with that. That's not where we're at in today's media. In today's media now, that debate's not even had. One platform's going to present it as that person's a promise breaker who cut education. One person's going to present it as that person's a, a champion. But it's occurring in what otherwise are considered mainstream media platforms. That is a generational shift for us that as we consider this issue, we need to keep in context. Uh, Tom, uh, as the uh, token uh, journalist on the panel, what's your view of, uh, of, the, of the new role of the media? Um, 
national media yeah i mean if you don't like trump you you have your outlets and if you do then you have other places but i don't know and i work in local media and local media is a, where you go i think the the last bastion of straight down the middle journalism it, if i tried to write a, a biased slanted story my editor uh would look at me like I was crazy and tell me to try again. I mean, it, it's just not tolerated. And I don't know, you know, I realized when I became a journalist after being in politics for years, I sort of kissed goodbye to my, my political agenda and my views. And I don't know why that's difficult for anyone. How much of this is moving away from print journalism? Um, well, what, what do you mean? I mean, uh, you know, I was a journalism major, you know, 50 years ago at USC. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, there was a standard and quality to print journalism, which baby and broadcast journalism, 24 hour news, uh, uh, internet doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. We have a high standard at the paper where I work and, um, you know, I hold myself to a high standard and, and, uh, you know, I work at a paper where we have experienced veteran reporters and some younger ones who are learning. Um, so, you know, I, I just, I just look at it as everything I write will you know, be left behind when I die. And that's what people will be able to look at. And I just take pride in trying to make it as complete as I can. And, and again, in local journalism, you're, you're held to a very high standard of, of uh, playing it straight down the middle and trying to be fair. And people don't come to us for um, news that affirms their view. Okay, thank you. Uh, we had a lot of questions on the US uh, electoral system and changing the primaries. Uh, does our two party system generate a zero sum uh, mindset? Uh, what about a uh, jungle primary versus uh, ranked choicing? Uh, uh, congressmen and scholars, any thoughts on these? how to reform the primary system. And, and Congressman Jolly said something, I think, uh, that for me was very correct. And that is right now, there's a lot of discussion among voters and, 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 and politicians on how to uh, reform our political system like there were in the 1920s and 30s. It seems like every 70, 80 years, there's a new wave of reform of uh, moving toward a more uh, perfect democracy. So uh, any thoughts on uh, primary? I'll, I'll jump in here. I first take first bite here. Um, look, I, as an attorney, I could make the case for a closed primary system and the courts have largely have largely provided protections to a closed primary system around the principle of freedom of association. A party is a private association that should be able to uh, conduct its, its nominating process based on the rules of a private organization. Um, but I would say if that is the argument, then let's flip the script and say, why are private organizations, private parties then, being subsidized and financially backed by all taxpayers to conduct closed primaries, right? We somehow have adopted this notion that party primaries are such, an, such a perfect part of our electoral system that we're going to pay for those. Well, I would suggest if you want a closed primary system, perhaps the party should have to pay for them themselves. And if they want to open them up, then perhaps all taxpayers could pay for it. So look, legally, there's a justification for closed primaries. I think politically, we have to make a value judgment. Is that providing the best, most responsive electoral system that works today, particularly when we know about 40% of new registered voters are rejecting the two-party system? And this is where, to, to your point, we are, we are in this emerging area of electoral reform. And I think what we're seeing on the Florida ballot is a good example of how they've tried to work the kinks out 
of trying to move to an open primary. Uh, that, that language suggests that parties can still have their nominating process and can say to the voters, these are our nominated candidates, but why don't we put everybody on a single statewide ballot and let all voters determine who should move, be the two candidates to move to November? Why is it that the system is set up that only the two major party nominees move to the November ballot, um, but for some other accommodations for minor parties and so forth? Uh, so look, I, I think there's a value judgment to be made among voters. Is this the best system we have or not? I think the data would suggest it's not. Um, the open primaries movement, now they're advocates for open primaries, have been very good at at confronting some of the criticisms of an open primary system, particularly around data that suggests we see greater diversity and representation, not just in thought, but in demographics in states that open up their primaries. And we see greater enfranchisement of voters who otherwise don't have an opportunity to participate early on in the electoral process of an election. Con Congressman Murphy. Any thoughts? And then, uh, Ka uh, Catherine, you written on election reform. Um, I, I had to step away for a second, so I missed the beginning of the question there. But um, Dave and I have had a chance to talk about this at some length. And, uh, you know, you look at a state like Florida and what 30 percent, 30 percent plus of the voters have no say in the primaries who, you know, the, the two parties ultimately end up with, with that you know, final decision. Uh, it's continuing to disenfranchise more and more voters, especially younger voters who are fed up with the two parties. Uh, then they get to the primary and the general and their person isn't even there. So uh, I, I think we need to, to really look at, at the structure uh, of what's happening. Uh, that to me goes right into the gerrymandering conversation where we need to truly have uh, more fair districts that, that are truly representative of a country where uh, the population and the voters are, are hopefully rewarding good behavior, rewarding compromise, rewarding, rewarding progress for our country. Uh, right now, it's, it's the opposite of that. So, um, I, you know, I, I think David is, is doing some great work right now with Amendment 3 on the ballot. And um, I think a lot of states that have already uh, pushed this forward uh, are seeing some good progress uh, toward a better democracy. Catherine, Sean, any thoughts? Well, I mean, certainly um, there's a lot of, if you look at the number of independents around the nation and in Florida, I mean, it's anywhere um, in a state from a quarter to a third of voters and in some Gallup polling data, you can see up to 40% of people self-identify as independent. So this move to open up, especially fully closed primary states of which Florida is one, uh, where you must be registered Republican to vote in a Republican primary or, or Democrat, vice versa, um, is an interesting concept. And, and I think um, California's example of a top two primary has had mixed results, especially if you look at some congressional districts uh, that are that favorably favor heavily one party or another, you end up having, say, two Democrats run or, or two Republicans, perhaps. Um, so there's some maybe unintended consequences associated with some of that reform. I think certainly what other states have done in terms of registered independents, or we call them NPAs, no party affiliation here in Florida, to pick a ballot would, would you know, sort of open up the process uh, at, at minimum. And I, I think it's particularly interesting. It's not what Amendment 3 is, but um, but the idea that independents really lean one way or another, uh, if you really ask them, they really are closet Republicans or Democrats, uh, would at least open up the process. And I think our electoral system, which favors a winner and a loser, is, is why we have a two-party system to begin with. So, you know, it, I think it's broader implications than just who's allowed to vote, but looking at um, something different from parliamentary systems where the percentage of a party will get a percentage of seats is not the system, certainly, that we have in the United States. Uh, yeah, and I would just add, uh, you know, I, I'm actually one of those folks who does change party registration back and forth so I can vote in Florida's closed primaries. Sure, not many people do that. And so I, I favor this Amendment 3 because it's better than what we have, but I don't think it's the solution. I, I'd rather go to a full open primary on each side. Um, but, but this can give us a chance to get more moderate 
uh, folks appealing to the middle. Whether it works or not, I'm not sure. But, you know, if I were more of a partisan, though, on the flip side, I would absolutely be against this opening up. You know, only the people who identify with your party should pick the party nominee. So I fully get that. And that's a big struggle that we have here is that those of us who want to bring folks to the middle, how can we do it, um, you know, other than changing the rules? And so this isn't the best rule change, but it's, but it's probably one that's going to uh, bring us closer to where we need to be. Um, I, I would make a, an observation. Um, the hardest part of this book was when Anthony and, um, and, um, Patrick uh, d did not follow my advice and insisted on putting this map on the different primary systems in the United States. Uh, it took me three weeks to uh, get this map done because all the rules were so different and it depended if you were running for the legislature or the state or, or, uh, or federal office, what was the primary rules? Uh, you know, from Nebraska to Florida to Louisiana, it, it was a horrible mess. And I think one of the um, questions I see from the audience is this idea that the American political system is very complicated to understand. I remember I spent two weeks in Colombia in uh, 2016 trying to explain the American political system and the idea that you know tomorrow we're not having a national election, but 51 state elections, 50 states in the District of Columbia. So uh, it, it, does, the, does the complicated nature of American politics and this, uh, this mixed jurisdiction, our federalism, uh, 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 add to this polarization? Uh, look, I'll give you a perspective um, that answers that question with a with a very strong yes. Um, not only on a state by state basis have these rules tilted the the power structure towards partisan actors and the parties. You know, take the idea of changing primaries in the state of Florida, for instance. Um, as as Sean mentioned, no party is going to try to open up their primaries. There's a disincentive to it, so we can't expect the two major parties in Tallahassee to change state legislation. So now voters have to mobilize, right? Organically mobilize to try to change the state constitution. That is a daunting project. There's no other platform by which voters can mobilize to do this, which is why you see these efforts often take multiple election cycles, like we saw with the gerrymandering reform in Florida. But I would also point to the fact that federalism in our elections, while I think it is uh, a very defensible position that all 50 states have different rules, makes it exceedingly difficult for a third party challenge to disrupt that. Uh, I'm involved with a group called the Serve America Movement, SAM. We largely operate as electoral reform task forces in states across the country. But in two states, we have candidates in New York and in Connecticut. And nothing about the party formation in those states translates to another state. So it is why you see the challenge among minor parties and third parties to be so great. There is not one system of rules that allows them ballot access in all 50 states if they wanted to form. They have to go state by state by state and comply with very different rules towards ballot access and party formation in each state. And it becomes increasingly expensive. It would probably cost uh, easily over $25 million simply to fund party formation in all 50 states. And even then, you've got to be able to bring the signatures and the voters along with you. So it is a challenge to disrupt this based on, on one element of just the federalism with which we treat our elections. Congressman Murphy? It, it's no doubt a, a heavy lift um, and, and going to take uh, some time. And I, I think it's interesting that you're starting to, to see more and more states kind of pick up momentum and, and, and some real thought around how to disrupt this system we have now. So I don't think we're to a critical mass yet, but certainly more and more people are talking about this. I think back to 
2012, 13, 14, there was very little discussion around this. And now it's a regular topic of, topic of conversation. Uh, I think a lot of it goes to what, you know, Catherine and I kind of pointed to earlier, and that's the fact that there's just a, a unbelievable uh, wave of people registering as MPAs right now. Uh, they want their voice to be heard. Uh, Sean and Catherine, please. You have to unmute Professor Foreman. I was gonna let Catherine go first. <laughs> Professor DePaulo. <laughs> well, again, I mean, I think we, we've talked a lot about what this might mean um, in terms of open primaries. I mean, we could talk about efforts at, at changing um, the deep partisan gerrymandering that occurs. I mean, I think if we're talking about all levels of change, um, it really has to come from the electorate, right? I mean, because politicians are not going to give up power. And, you know, I, I wrote a book on, on term limits in Florida, and it was really this push from voters um, who wanted to do lots of things, some of which have not happened, but trying to, to break up what they felt was an undemocratic process. And I think, I mean, it's one of the questions I get asked all the time, anywhere I go, when somebody finds out I'm a political scientist, it's, well, why do we only have two parties? Why, you know, we need more parties. You know, we need to open things up. And a lot of times people don't necessarily know what that means, what that would look like, what the consequences would be. And sometimes we don't know until things are implemented what it might actually mean. But a lot of times when you have these ballot initiatives um, and, and we'll see what will happen in Florida in Amendment 3 specifically, but there's other states uh, with, with other, other reforms as well. People, when I say generally, um, are, are apt to open up processes that they feel are more democratic with a small d. So, you know, we will see what that might mean, but the, the idea that there's this monopoly of, of the two party system is something that other than, you know, those sort of deep partisans, um, people are willing to, I think, open up to change, um, to, to allow more openness for more people to participate. Uh, and we'll see, you know, after tomorrow, uh, you know, we, we have people who are so deeply partisan, however, in the electorate, um, that we're at this sort of strange um, era, I think, in which most, most people would say, let's open this process up, um, but yet are deeply partisan themselves. Uh, Sean? Yeah, so I'll just add, you know, there've been talk about, should we have a third party or multiple parties? Uh, and uh, frankly, we probably should, but while the political parties are pretty bad at some things, what they're good at is self-survival at the national, state, and local level. They're able to adapt. They're able to control these rules, as we've talked about, in each state to maintain their own power structures. So it's, it's really hard to bring any of those particular changes. And the parties are good also at, uh, if not realigning, at least slightly modifying to keep up with the political environment. So when the Tea Party movement happened in 2009, 10, 11, you know, there's this thought maybe there'd be a new Tea Party. But, you know, frankly, the Republican Party co-opted, consumed, and Trump made it a Trumpian slash Tea Party focused uh, group um, rather than a third party. Democrats are going through the same thing. We'll see what happens with the results here and what the future is. Are they going to be more moderate or progressive? But I think that because of the way our system structured, because of the rules, we're going to be stuck with these two parties just sort of inching a little bit closer and further away to the center based on political events. Um, I'm going to give uh, David and uh, uh, the last word, and, and and this is sort of a general and unfair question, but how dangerous is American polarization right now? Well, it certainly is dangerous to informed and consensus-driven public policy, right? Most of the biggest challenges we face in our public policy could easily be solved if we didn't have the hyperpartisanship incentives that we see. And I'll, I'll give you an example, you know, in healthcare, if we had three constituencies essentially going into the Affordable Care Act debate, you had those who needed additional access, 
those who needed greater affordability. And then you had those that truly saw disruption, right? They lost their doctor, they lost their plan, their prices spiked. Because of the way the partisanship works in today's environment, Democrats were able to succeed speaking only to the first two groups, those who needed additional access, those who needed additional affordability. Republicans were able to succeed speaking just to the third, saying, you're losing your doctor, you're, you're losing your plan. It's not a hard solution to speak to all three, but there's no reward to it. So I would say, and, and you can go down issue by issue from guns to immigration to the environment. The reality is there is consensus to be had, but there's not the incentive for the parties to actually reach that consensus. There's incentive to continue to perform as partisans. Um, so it is a detriment to public policy. There is so much we could be accomplishing. Frankly, we could see remarkable economic growth. We could see continued peace and prosperity if, if we actually had consensus driven policy solutions. But then I would say the second concern, how detrimental is it, comes around kind of the moral calling of our leaders at every level. And I'll put it in the context of the election we're having right now. My great concern with the election comes down to a, a leadership inflection point by either of the major candidates, whether to affirm the validity of the outcome. When we saw in 2000, the Gore v. Bush debate, and listen, that went on for 30 something days and tensions were high, but at the end of the day, each candidate accepted the result. Certainly Bush did, but Al Gore went to the microphone the night of the Supreme Court decision and said, I disagree with it, but I accept it. Warren Christopher, who was arguing his case, said this is not a constitutional crisis. This is actually how a free country operates to protect free elections. That was a different era. My concern about the way partisanship is both played and rewarded today is in the days between November 3rd and January 20th, if either one of the major candidates does not accept the finality of the election, the, the bully pulpit is an awesome influence on our body politic. And it is very easy to use that bully pulpit to play to our partisan divisions and our partisan fears. And I worry about how partisanship could affect the country if on January 20th, the president who's being sworn in is not seen as the, the legitimately duly elected president of the United States by a large portion of our country. That problem is a calling really for all of us as much as it is for structural reform in our electoral system. Um, Congressman uh, Murphy, I uh, asked um, Congressman Jolly, and I'll give you the last word now, is how dangerous is the uh, polarization in American politics today? As dangerous as you can get for a democracy, right? I mean, all the uh, fundamentals have been laid right now for a, a major problem. Um, don't want to fear monger. I know David doesn't either, but uh, it's not crazy to think about what could happen if this is a contested election where uh, the, the, faint, the flames have been, have been sort of flame, you know, fueled already, already and fanned. And, you know, people are starting to discredit our democracy, our election. People are already asking me, do you really trust the votes? Do you really trust what's going to happen? Th these shouldn't be even legitimate, much less questions at all, uh, in our democracy right now. Uh, Kind of adding on to all the political problems that we have and every, at least structural problem we've discussed uh we're still in a recession right our, our economy has, has has come back after coronavirus but the jobs that have come back are in many ways the easy ones uh there's millions if not tens of millions of jobs that are left to come back and more and more people are being displaced which means more and more uncertainty and hatred uh finger pointing um, so you have a, sort of this perfect mix with, with, with technology starting to displace more and more jobs where you could see uh, hatred get to a whole new level and the, the, this cult-like following we are seeing, this, this, this religion really that we're seeing uh, where facts just don't matter anymore. Uh, it, it's a scary confluence of events that we have. So I'm, I'm very concerned about not only the election, but the con but how it plays out in the next month or two, but then beyond that in the next couple of years, because I think regardless of who wins or loses, there's going to be a lot of people uh, going to bed for many nights that are upset and don't believe what had just happened. Well, I'm praying for the decisive election, uh, whatever way it goes. Um, and let me thank the panel. Um, um, we're ending uh, on time. 
which is another miracle. Uh, and so let me turn it over to Brian and he can close us out. Thanks, doc, Dr. Moreno. Uh, first off, you, you get the first shout out for driving an incredible conversation. I, I knew you were a brilliant professor. I had no idea that you were also a brilliant moderator, but I thought that was an exceptional discussion. I also wanna thank, of course, the speakers for sharing their ideas. It, it's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's in this book. And I think this book, again, is a testament to, to the discussion uh, around the issue of bipartisanship in America. I wanna thank the, the leadership of Congressman Murphy and Jolly, and of course, uh, Dr. Moreno, you and Dr. Gamara as editors uh, for this exceptional contribution to our understanding of the structural issues undermine, undermining bipartisanship in America. Uh, the book, A Divided Union, Structural Challenges to Bipartisanship in America is available on Amazon for $44. I think that's another miracle. To have a book at Rutledge come out and go straight into the $40 range uh, is, is, uh, is a feat, um, much like you know, bringing the country back around partisanship. Uh, but if you use the Rutledge press link that Congressman Murphy posted in the chat, you get an additional 20% off. And I think that's amazing too. Uh, finally, vote if you haven't already. Voting is fundamental to our democratic system and our democracy hinges on a participatory American electorate. So please make sure that you're out there and doing your part. And with that, that's a wrap everyone. Thanks for joining.